Hello students, what I'm doing now is just informing you of three recent additions to visual communication in the news. It turns out all three of them were in today's New York Times, uh, so I put links to them in that module. The first one was uh, somewhat surprising in that it says that despite the fact that people in Russia uh, have access to mass media that is very heavily controlled by the government. They also have free access to YouTube. And so there are people in Russia today who are critical of the current government or they are comedians doing social commentary. And these people have millions of followers in Russia uh, because Russia does not control access uh, to YouTube for its citizens. The second one had to do with the uh, fact that in the past, uh, American embassies and consulates around the world flew a pride flag during this month, June, which is Pride Month. And so this year, when the uh, embassy or consulate in Brazil asked the State Department for permission to fly the pride flag, they were denied. And this was a change in policy from past administrations, which basically felt that LGBT rights were human rights, and it was particularly uh, significant in Brazil, where the recent election of a far right-wing government uh, has sort of hampered LGBTQ rights. And then finally, the last one is an op-ed page about, the title is How Facial Recognition Makes You Safer. So we've seen already several articles about facial recognition and possible dangers and consequences to it. But this one is written by James O'Neill, the police commissioner for New York City. And he basically explains how uh, facial recognition is a very valuable tool for policing in the 21st century. And he goes into some detail explaining the procedures that they will use to make sure that facial recognition is not abused and that uh, people's privacy or civil rights are not violated by the use of facial recognition by the New York Police Department. So that's the facial, that's the uh, visual communication in the news for this week. And now I will append this to a, well, oh, maybe 20 minute video basically where I'm just going through the agenda for this module, module 4.1, uh, to tell you uh, what we're looking at. So uh, I'll be back on camera soon. So what I'm going to do right now is just go through uh, the agenda for this week, tell you about some things, and then uh, try and uh, explain some of the readings that we've already had and give you a preview of uh, some of the things you're going to be looking at in the module and then end up by talking about the midterm uh, visual analysis uh, essay. All right. The other piece of visual communication in the news I've actually loaded in as the last page in the module for week seven and it is from this week's New York Times magazine and it's called The Business of Color and it's about a company uh, by the name of Pantone, and Pantone has sort of cornered the market on, um, okay, if you have a certain blue, cerulean blue, um, they will give it a name and a number, and that way people who make uh, paint for your home, or people who make fabric for your curtains, or people who make upholstery for your car, uh, can all be in agreement on what a certain color is. It'll have a name, it'll have a number, and Pantone are the people sort of in charge of designating those things. And so in that uh, page on the module uh, and, and in the article itself, there was a pointer to a scene. If some of you saw The Devil Wears Prada, uh, there's a scene in which Meryl Streep's character uh, basically takes uh, Anne Hathaway's character to task for having laughed at the fact that she couldn't tell the difference between two color blues. And Meryl Streep uh, ends up kind of um, giving her quite a dressing down and saying that, um, you know, she thinks she ch chose the blue sweater that she happens to be wearing, but in fact, uh, it was chosen by people in the room who make those kind of decisions. So uh, it's a fairly interesting article about the business of color. So discuss the Oswald and Levy readings. So the Oswald reading, I thought, was um, a pretty good job of sort of applying some of these more um, esoteric uh, theories. When you're reading them as written by the French 
philosopher and semiotician Roland Barthes, um, it gets pretty wiggy pretty quickly. But uh, Oswald, um, after the introduction, and some of that was stuff, I said you didn't have to read certain pages because we already covered that almost in the first week, week when we were talking about Saussurian linguists, linguistics versus Piercean linguistics. But one of the things that keeps coming up is this notion of um, structuralism. And so um, Oswald has a couple of charts, and here I have them in the hard copy, but when I'm done recording this, I will actually bring in linkages to these uh, sort of structuralist uh, diagrams. You could call them semiotic squares. And um, they rely on the idea that there are all these opposites. So we have male and we have female. We have power, we have powerless. We have mature versus trendy. We have individualistic versus social. So these different concepts that are in these diagrams are ones that can help people talk about an image and what it is communicated. So again, we're back to that idea that we communicate with words. Images have this tremendous power to communicate, but our ability to talk about images depends upon some agreement, uh, you know, linguistic terms, theoretical terms. So um, Oswald does, I think, a pretty good job of applying this uh, semiotics to a couple case studies. So she's got the case study of McDonald's and how they were hurting at one point because they were losing market share and part of it had to do with the fact that they seemed to not take seriously uh, a very large uh, segment of the market which were the women and so they they did some uh, semiotic analysis and came up with some advertising that was sort of more appealing and friendly to women and then we had um, um, a compact computer that ended up failing and so I thought that uh, the Oswald essay, uh, if nothing else, she did a good job of applying semiotics to a couple of cases and particularly used some of the tools to talk about uh, images that were in there. And then the Levy reading, um, I thought that was really charming, particularly because if you look at it, that doesn't look like the Harvard Business Review of today uh, because it's from the 50s, but the, the clip art in it made it uh, uh, quite almost silly. And so, uh, but he had some really good points. Levy, or Oswald says that Levy basically is the one who introduced the idea that advertising uh, and consumer branding uh, is working in symbols. And so before this, uh, people hadn't thought much about it. So even though Levy doesn't use any of the new technical jargon of semiotics, he really was saying that what we have are symbols for sale. And if you think of, you say, well, you know, how symbolic is all this stuff? Imagine you have a teenager who would like a pair of Air Jordans and they would like an iPhone. And instead, what you deliver to them are sort of the, you know, uh, brand, you know, Sears brand name sneakers and some, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, old Nokia phone. They would be, you know, just heartbroken at how you had sort of uh, uh, not met their expectations because. It's not the actual sneaker or the phone itself so much as what Air Jordan symbolize and what an iPhone symbolizes. And so these and other brands have succeeded very well in selling people these ideas that are really about their identity. Okay. So what you're going to find in the module for week seven is uh, a lot of stuff on logo and brand design. And so most of this is stuff that you'll be reading or viewing inside of Canvas. Uh, initially, there's some theory about how logos work. Um, there's some pretty nice examples of logos for the National Hockey League. And if you look at those and see the ones that are considered the best and the worst, you'll probably get a sense of, you know, why is it that these uh, old style ones are really regarded as the best? And why is it some of the new ones are, are really the worst? But in addition, you will find um, an article that talks about, you know, what makes a good logo, what should it do. Um, we have also a short video about Google. When Google redid its logo, uh, a lot of people were sort of appalled by that because uh, they liked the old logo. And so people uh, do not respond well to change, but there's some uh, interesting commentary on, um, you know, there's, there's both a video by Google about the new logo, 
and then there's a uh, article about people's uh, resistance to the new logo. Um, and then there's also a page on the evolution of the Starbucks logo. The Starbucks logo has changed four or five times already um, since the firm was founded. It's not that old. And so there are reasons behind the logo. And one of the things that the Starbucks logo that other logos are doing is becoming more pictorial and they have fewer words. And so this is a trend which seems to be, uh, you know, all logos seem to be going in that direction. There's then a page about Chip Kidd, who is the premier um, book designer. Um, if you were to go into a Barnes and Nobles and, and look at some of the biggest best-selling books that had, you know, really uh, sort of strongly attractive graphical covers, there's a good chance that Chip Kidd is the designer who designed some of those. So I have a link to the Chip Kidd site. I'd say look around in there because uh, he's he's just a brilliant designer and there's uh, and he's very entertaining. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. But there's also a page for Milton Glaser, who is sort of one of the premier graphic designers uh, of our time. Um, if you've ever seen the I Love New York uh, um, logo, that is his work. Um, there's a famous um, uh, sort of multicolor image of Bob Dylan that was uh, an insert into a, a Dylan uh, album from the 60s, etc. So Milton Glaser is, is just brilliant. Then there's also a page from Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein is a Canadian. She's a sort of a theorist. She's an educator. And so she has a book called No Logo. And so the gist of that is logos are not innocent and logos are not necessarily your friends. And so it's quite a critique of the degree to which we are constantly bombarded with these logos. And so, you know, we as mature adults, we can say, oh, fine, we can ignore it, we can do whatever we want. When you think of the impact on young people and the way they are then sort of uh, exhorted to uh, own this and buy that and have the best one and the most expensive one. Uh, so Naomi Klein has uh, some fairly strong opinions on the harmful and negative aspects of uh, the way logos have pervaded our society. Um, and then we've got the Olympic pictograms through the ages. And that one is, um, uh, Heller is his name, and he is uh, sort of one of the premier graphic designers of, of all time. And so that's a, a short little video, which is, is quite entertaining and uh, will communicate quite a bit in a short period. Okay. So let me see if this. Oh, also, um, Levy mentions the Spring Made ad, the Clabber Girl and the Pepsi Girl. And so one of the things he says is suggests that the average consumer might miss or ignore the humor in a Spring Made sheet advertisement. And so there's a copy of such an ad. Um, it, you know, you could say, well, it's humorous. You could also say it's sexist, it's racist. So uh, it may not be deemed as humorous today as it was in the 50s. But at the time, um, there was sort of a message there. And so then there's the example of the uh, sort of clabber girl as an example of uh, an outdated symbol. And then we have the more current Pepsi girl, but this is the Pepsi girl from the 50s. So um, those are kind of interesting. Um, there's a whole thing on logo and brand design that includes um, Hillary Clinton's logo in a 2016 campaign, the original Trump-Pence logo, which was then revised because people made a uh, sort of uh, scandalous uh, animated GIF of it. And so they switched to a different logo. Then we've got the uh, NHL logos. Um, Google's new logo. The Starbucks, so there are four different Starbucks. So from 1971, when it said Starbucks coffee, tea, and spices, to the present one, which I'm not sure when the present one was launched, uh, but that, that one now has no words. So it went for, with more words to fewer words to no words, and theirs is not the only logo that has gone in that direction. We've got Chip Kidd. We've got Milton Glaser. We've got uh, No Logo. Pictograms. All right, and then now we get to the assignment, so the midterm essay assignment. There is a page for Paul Martin Lester's Six Perspective. If you think back to the first class meeting, and we talked about different approaches, there was Gestalt, etc. 
and one was the Lester Huxley model. And it's called that because Paul Martin Lester, a current uh, faculty member in California who teaches uh, visual communication, um, is a great believer in some of the things that Huxley said about images, including the more you know, the more you see. So Paul Martin, Lex, uh, Paul Martin Lester's book is called Visual Communication Images with Messages. And so what I have done is I've uploaded one chapter of this book, and it is um, section four, the media through which we see. And what it does is it introduces Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives, and they are personal, historical, technical, ethical, cultural, and critical. And so you should read that article, read that chapter. It's not long. It's pretty straightforward because when you look at the midterm image analysis assignment, you will see that you have the option of picking any number of the theoretical approaches that we've covered so far. Most people, for the past three times that I've taught this course, have chosen Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives because it is very easy to apply. And so uh, I'd say, by all means, choose that if you want. If you'd rather choose Gestalt approach, you can do that. If you remember that 35-slide uh, PowerPoint, How Pictures Work, that is basically a pictorial representation of the Gestalt approach. So you could do a Gestalt analysis. You could try to do something with uh, Roland Barthes' semiotic analysis of an image. Um, the assignment specifies that the image you pick, and you can pick anything. You can pick an ad, and as Bart said, one of the advantages of picking an ad, there's no ambiguity as to what the advertiser was trying to do. They're at least trying to get you to uh, know what they sold and think positively of their product in some way. Um, so you could pick an ad, but you could pick a, a, a work of fine art. You could pick a painting. You could pick a work of your own art. Uh, you could pick some graffiti that's on a wall somewhere. So there's no restrictions. Or that whole collection of images, when we had the first shot in analyzing an image, you looked at a whole collection of what are news photographs from the New York Times, and it was the year in pictures. So you pick any image that you want and then analyze it using some theory that you would like to apply to it. But if the image has any words, then you need to also address the words. And this is specified in the details on the images uh, on the assignment. Um, so there you can choose to either use Bart's uh, approach to uh, the way words often serve as anchorage for an image, or you could use either of the Lupton and Miller essays that are talking about uh, typography and words, or you could use uh, uh, the uh, uh, Goodhart Wilcox chapter, which talks about text, etc. But um, if there are words in the image you're analyzing, you need to somehow address them. And then there's a note in the Paul Martin Lester Six Perspective Perspectives. What he does is one of his perspectives is ethical. Well, when he goes into the ethical perspective, then he branches into six different sort of ethical approaches. You don't need to try and get each one of the six ethical approaches to talk to your image because uh, in some cases it would just not be appropriate. So you might choose to just have one ethical approach if you're using the Lester Six Percent perspectives. Um, and then what I have on the page after that, I think, is a sample that I did myself. So I took an image, it was an image that was actually on a music CD, but I knew that before it was on that music CD, it came from the 60s and it came from uh, the circumstances when the United States was involved in the Vietnam War. And so you can read my uh, uh, image essay analysis and what I'm doing there is I am using Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives. So. Um, I think that wraps it up for what I'm going to be saying here about this upcoming